we all know that making Canadian television, making any kind of television, isn't easy. I happen to think it's a little bit like a heist. Basically, you're locked up at home or maybe writer jail, and you're thinking about what you want to do when you get out. And I'm not suggesting revenge or love or a little bit of greed is your motivator, but Joe, in this scenario, you are George Clooney. So <laughs> George has an idea about how to rob the Bellagio. And by that, I mean, he's gonna put together a team, including his old buddy, Brad Pitt, and the new kid, Matt Damon. And eventually they're gonna bust into the vault where all the money from the other casinos, the CMF, CTV, NBC, etc., is stashed. You get in, you get out, easy peasy. For those of you listening in, in case you were wondering, this is actually how Canadian TV gets made. It's totally not a metaphor. So, Joe, I mean, Joe, you're in the cell. You're dreaming of this ultimate heist. Can you walk us through the genesis of the plan, how you dreamed up this particular story, this specific character, and since you weren't trying to get Julia Roberts back, what drove you to want to pursue this show above all others? Wow. Um, hi, Shelley. Hi, Joe. <laughs> uh, well, I, I will say that, great question. Um, when I, if I think about how this came into existence, uh, I would go back to, it was late 2016, early 2017, and um, I was in the kind of jail that writers <laughs> find themselves in, where I had finished something, and I didn't know what was next. And so we all kind of know what that's like. And um, you don't know whether you'll ever get out of that jail, frankly. And uh, so it was late 2016, it was early 2017. And um, there had been, if you recall, a relatively consequential election in the United States um, at that time. And the idea of immigration was very topical. It was something that was really in the air after that uh, election. And in Canada, um, similarly, there was a lot being written and talked about and said about the crisis in Syria at that time. There were a lot of Syrians who had come over and there was just a lot being written about the conflict and about how it um, was in some way, you know, how it felt close to home in some way because there were Syrians who were coming. So I had been open, I had been open to that like all of us were at the time. And I was also working with um, two producers at Sphere Media, Virginia Rankin and Tara Woodbury. And we had done a previous show together and we were, we wanted to do something new together. And we had been talking about a lot of things, among them uh, a medical drama. Uh, we all were interested in doing a medical drama. I particularly was. I had kind of weaned myself on ER in the 90s obsessively. It's still the greatest thing ever. And I really loved the freedom that that show illustrated we could have in the medium. Um, if you go back and study it now, it's totally current. It's amazing. And it, it seemed to me that starting with around Grey's Anatomy, there was a kind of template to the way medical dramas were made about surgeons and a kind of general, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, it's just kind of the way it was. There was just a kind of template that evolved to the show. And so I was thinking about that and um, doing a lot of research actually into residents because I was interested in residents. And you quickly stumble into, you kind of circle back into the idea of how difficult it is for foreign trained doctors, international medical students to qualify to do their residency in Canada. And so when I stumbled onto that, um, in conjunction with the conversations I was having with the great people at Sphere, this idea of, you know, telling an immigrant story, a refugee story, and a medical story at the same time, it just sort of emerged there for us. And we, we, we thought there was something there. You know, we thought that, that, was, that it was a novel way to pursue the subject matter and that it would allow us to do all of the things we wanted to do in various formats. And so 
you know, there's a lot of ancillary things I can talk about around there, but that's where it sprung from. And, you know, that what that, what that begot was like a really honest um, and, and question about whether we should even be, or I should even be telling this story. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, after we all liked the idea, the idea, after we all liked the idea, the question was how to, how to earn the right to tell it, you know, and I say that acknowledging that it was only four years ago, but it was a very different time. And if we had had the idea right now, I don't know that we would have pursued it, but then um, we did, but we did with, with a, with, like I said, a, a sort of this goal of, can I earn the right to tell the story? And that meant, you know, talking, you could talk to, you could read, of course, volumes of information on people's lived experiences. And you could also, uh, at the time, talk to um, people with it and to try to like take in as much as you can to try to discover whether or not you have the ability to tell that story honestly. And so a lot of, a lot of time and effort after the idea came up went into that process and um, continued all the way through the making of the show and still continues to this day. But that brought us to the point where we had uh, decided that, that there was um, something here that we, that we could do and that we felt that we had a responsibility to do it right, but that we could do it. And you know, around that time, uh, there was the idea of the character of Bash, who is the main character of the show. And he sort of independent of the research and everything else had existed sort of almost from inception as this, you know, what I would say in the pitch, in the room to CTV and to everybody was, I was tired of the anti-hero. It's enough with the anti-hero. Mm. The guy's a hero. And I would say, think Indiana Jones meets Alexander Hamilton. Even then I was a little bit obsessed with the play. And, <laughs> and that's what we would say, you know, and we, and then we also, I would, I would also say that he was that character, the hero, not the anti-hero the man of bold action, and that he, um, he was also a listener. And that was something that attracted me and everybody else to it a lot. And there was a little buzzword that I used to say, which is that he, he's the kind of person that you tell all your secrets to, and then you don't realize that you don't know anything about him when you've confided everything you know about yourself. And so we kind of quickly had like a real picture for who the character was and what was interesting about the character just from the core. And just to circle back to answer your question, why that, why did that become our focus, my focus? It was because it just, it emerged as something with a lot of hope and a lot of optimism and a lot of potential right away. And it just felt like something, you know, not overnight after months and months of work that I wanted to put all my chips in. I love how you speak in full paragraphs. That's really impressive. Um, (laughs) um, Okay, so Brad, I mean, Rachel. You and Joe have partnered up before. And although I do think that the scope of this particular heist might have been slightly larger in terms of like budget and uh, locations and characters. So um, can you tell us what excited you about the plan when uh, Joe first started talking to you about it? And if there was anything that terrified you about both say the subject and the scope? Um, I love that I get to be Brad Pitt because he ate through that entire movie. He just was eating <laughs> ice cream the whole time. I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I worked with Joe on This Life, um, and that was my first, like, real writing job. Um, and so I, we had, a, I think, a great creative synergy on that show. And just by the nature of what that show was, uh, I ended up getting a lot more responsibility than you normally would on your first job. Um, And I think we worked really well together. So, you know, hearing that Joe had another show going, he'd let me know when he was developing it, what the idea was and kind of kept me apprised of it just because we stayed friends. And I was like, make sure you tell me what's happening. So the the first thing that excited me about about doing it was working with Joe again. Um, And then, you know, once I kind of got to dig into the creative material, um, understanding that it was a medical show that was about, actually about human nature. Um, and on top of that, about uh, somebody who was up against it and up against so much to kind of get this job. Like I'm, you know, it's a real underdog story. Um, 
And so those two things kind of made me go, this is different than anything that I've have seen and, and read over the last little while. And um, it's exciting because it's a show that uses the structure of a medical show to support what is actually a show about character and emotion. And that's sort of where I live as a writer. Um, and, you know, I think part of that was trained into me by Joe on, on this life. And part of that is just who I am as a person. So it, it felt like something that I could add add voice to or add something to hopefully um and so you know I just kind of kept bugging him along the way like let me know what's going on let me know what's going on and then when it got close you know I think I, I think I said as your friend I know you need to staff your show however you want to staff it and like I get that that is whatever you need but also sh I should let you know I I actively want to do this show I want to work with you again and and he was like yeah that would be great I think your voice would fit um so it felt exciting to kind of think about what that was going to look like um in terms of the terrifying aspect the scope was definitely uh scary it was certainly I'd done um one procedural before and it was a period piece so it was I'd never worked on a medical show or a legal show or a cop show and I was like yeah I can totally I know what I'm doing fine um but I was nervous about how that would uh, work out and then logistically you know I live in Vancouver um I, we, I started the show three days after moving into a new apartment and I was supposed to start two days before that but you know um it was for logistic reasons it was going to be a big upheaval for me and I ended up spending I think almost 11 months away uh for you know I traveled back and forth but it was very brief trips home so that I'd, I'd worked away before but never quite to that um, degree or intensity so that was a definitely a challenge for me in terms of like what kind of things did I want to take on and was that something that I could you know give myself to and feel like it was you know going to be worth the cost of spending time away and and it was it as soon as I got the creative I was like this is amazing I, I, I need to do this so um yeah Okay, I, I want to remember if we can to circle back to the working while not in your own hometown question, because I think that um, all of you probably have some great advice for writers about how to um, best balance life and work, especially when you're not in your own city. But um, for now, uh, I'd like to talk to Matt, I mean, Sammy. Um, now it's my understanding that I'm going to batter this metaphor into the ground, you guys. It's my understanding that this was your first heist. Um, so can we, can you talk to us a little bit about what it was like being dropped into the world of, uh, you know, it both procedural and serialized TV, I would say, uh, one hour drama, your first one hour drama, and, um, also maybe touch on what was your biggest learning curve slash curves? Yeah, um, so we, Joe and I actually were just talking about this uh, a couple days ago, but the fact that none of us uh, had worked on a medical show was probably an asset because we didn't have like the hangups and sort of internalizations that you would on, you know, if you've worked three seasons, four seasons on medical procedural, so that meant there was a ton more work for us to do. Um, and like, I mean, Joe especially, and Rachel too, uh, but we were just in the weeds on medical research, just building stories that were realistic and grounded. And uh, Rachel was great about just drawing stories from friends' experience, from personal experience. So it, it, it felt grounded. They weren't, you know, outlandish kind of housey style things. And it, it needed to be that way because it, uh, you know, it was grounded in this guy Bash's journey. Um, and we were trying to build this, this new thing, right? This like medical show, but with this kind of madman-esque character at the center of it, this mysterious background. And you're, you know, you're unfurling the, the mystery as we go. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think the fact that I didn't have like traditional TV experience may have been an asset. Um, and, uh, because we wouldn't get boxed in, we'd reconsider things. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, notes would come in 
from the room, from the producers, from the network. And, you know, we try and attack solutions from different angles. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, 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 it's impossible to overestimate the, the work that Joe put into the show, like years before we went into production, like not just with the medical stuff, which is legion, like so much medical research, talking to tons of emergency room doctors in Toronto and, you know, in Montreal. But then, you know, like he was teasing, like uh, talking to Syrian refugees and, um, you know, understanding their plight. And one thing that I was thinking about in this run up to the panel is the, the, the sort of the trauma, the character's trauma that is like key to the show. Um, and, you know, which is quite bold and quite groundbreaking for a network show to have a guy with PTSD who's brown, who uh, is a Muslim. And, you know, I think there was, for Joe and his family, he's Jewish, the specter of the Holocaust, you know, it's like it gave him an in and a, a, a way to think about the story that uh, really made it like a, a puzzle that he was trying to figure out and an urgency to it. And, you know, being a, a sort of creator of color, being Muslim, that that uh, obsession to fidelity and to the truth, the emotional truth that Joe uh, had and has uh, is really inspiring. That's, that's like what you hope to get in a boss. And I think, you know, Rachel would probably agree too. That's why not having a TV background, I wanted to work with Joe and Tara when they approached me in 2017. And to be honest, I probably wouldn't have worked on the show unless it was the concept of the show that they had. And it was the way Joe and Tara talked about it. Um, and, you know, for like new, new writers, what I'd say is that it's good to be able to talk about something other than TV, you know, to like have a career, to have a life outside of TV. Like, so you're not just quoting Grey's Anatomy or Code Black, but you, you like Joe was like a lawyer for years um, and, you know, has the, the battle wounds from that. Um, and I think that's what, in, in, in the room, what really stands out, people who draw from personal experience. Um, so, I mean, if there are people 22 years old, I don't know if that's a thing, going straight to film school, going straight to the CFC, all power to you, but it's also like live a life, like live a well-rounded life. So your story is like authentic. And I think that that's like, at this sort of historical moment, I hope that there's sort of a, a shift in the Canadian TV industry that accounts for that. So, you know, there's not just the set path to becoming a TV writer, but we understand that, you know, like in the States, Issa Rae, Michaela Cole, Rami Youssef have these like unconventional paths to becoming a creator. Um, and I hope the doors will open in Canada uh, more to that too. Um, and that's, again, that's like part of the success of Transplant because of that unconventional the unconventional backgrounds all of us had. I, I, yeah, I think that um, I met Joe while he was still getting through his own PTSD over being a lawyer. Um, <laughs> he, he seems much more fully recovered these days. Um, Sammy, so what would, you came from a, a documentary background? Yeah, I worked in independent in, in documentary film in New York. Uh, I was born in Canada. I was born, I'm in Sarnia right now where I grew up. But then I, I lived most of my life in, in the, the US, my adult life in the US. And so when in 2017, like just after that sort of genesis moment that Joe was talking about, um, Joe had written the pilot and then they were starting a development room, a little small development room. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I came up from New York and we tried to figure out what the story was, but I mean, the, the pilot, like I, I said this, uh, whenever in February, when it aired, it's like you, remarkable how little the pilot changed. It's like, that is the show, right? You watch the pilot, and, you know, for subsequent episodes are more in the hospital, but like that is the show. And mm -hmm. that was like dialed in really, really early on. That's that, that core emotional idea that Joe, you know, was describing at the top. Um, and it's, it's kind of a marvel in that way. I love that you're um, advocating for uh, bringing outlier, outlier status to a writing room. Um, and 
you know, the, the benefits of, of having done other things previously and, and how it can enrich the experience. Um, but I think also you must have, you were thrown into the production machinery for the first time at, at, at that level. And um, if you can sort of single out the one or two things that uh, surprised you or that were like the biggest, uh, this is what I have to get used to moments for you as a, you know, first time uh, one hour drama writer? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, it's less about the craft and more about the politics, actually. I didn't realize how, like, I'm going to be real. It's like, I didn't realize how the complicated the politics can get. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that it's, you have to be a loyal person, right? You have to be, you have to, you have to understand where your loyalties are and, you know, your loyalties are to the story and to your, 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 uh, your showrunner. Um, and I think that that, uh, that's something that I, I think can kind of get lost in the film and TV world. It's like kind of looked at as a, like naive and, you know, as a uh, quaint. Um, but that's, uh, to be honest, that's something that I really admire about Joe and Rachel is like their friendship is like so tight. I think like Rachel's uh, underestimating probably how uh, Joe was thinking of her as she was like asking about transplant. He probably was like, of course I'm gonna bring Rachel because I know uh, she's got my back. Um, and I think that's like really important when you're like, when you're putting yourself out there, when there are millions of dollars on the line, it's like, you know, you want to make sure someone has your back. Um, and, but it's hard navigating the politics and threading the needle with the producers and the network and, you know, uh, and everyone wants to do a good job. Everyone wants to do the, the best job possible, but it's got to be like a, you know, like an army unit, right? It's got to be clear. The lines of, uh, of uh, the chain of command has to be clear. Um, so that's what I'd say was probably the biggest learning curve, just like understanding those dynamics. Great. I love that. Um, so Joe, while you were, went through the process of developing the show and I'd sort of forgotten how long it was. Um, I read a script uh, like about a six months before you guys went into production. And you just like, when you read it, you go, oh, well, here goes the show. It's starting now. But of course, there's all the work that came before. What, through the process of both developing it on your own, eventually bringing people in, then as it starts to, you know, widen out, um, what was your true north in terms of like the thing you knew always had to be true about the show? And how did you communicate that uh, both to your team and to all the other circles around you? The, the true north is is definitely Bash's emotional journey, and so, you know, those are just words. They sound easy when you say them. They're unbelievably hard to tell honestly. You know, to really get underneath and keep grounded and keep keep real. And so, I did say all along that's what the show was. The show, the show is about Bash's emotional journey starting over, and the the soul of that. It needed to be human, it needed to be honest, it needed to be grounded, and that would inform everything else. That that's, it would inform everything else, not in a mirror-y way, like we could talk about in the writer's room, we say everything's too matchy-matchy, not in that way, but in an honest way. And I would go like this, <laughs> it starts like this with him, and then it can slowly widen out over time, but by that we, I always meant like not in one episode, like in one season, it could slowly widen out. So, um, so, the, so you drill down on who he is and on what his emotional needs are, um, what he's experiencing both like from, basic need, from a basic need physical perspective and from an emotional perspective, how he feels about his past, his present and his future. And you let that inform the storytelling. So you you mine that as much as you can for theme. Um, you don't hold the writers to like exactitudes of theme because we all know that's a waste of time. But you just this, the soul of soul of theme. Like what, what journey? What is his journey? And then how can slowly? How can slowly? You know the other characters get their own journeys. They're sort of they're, they're a part of the body, but they're ancillary in a way. But if we have his story, 
So that's to how to keep the reddish to the true north. That was the question. What is the frame, I would say? What is Bash's emotional journey in the episode? Uh, how are we telling it? And, and then if we can answer that question, you know, we had as a writer's room, you know, just to briefly like Sammy and Rachel, you know, and everybody, amazing, you know, just an amazing gift surrounded by people who really got what we wanted to do and everybody and you know, so that was great. So you're working with that as an incredible team of heisters. <laughs> but um, we, we knew roughly what the journey we were taking him on was from the beginning. We knew where we wanted him to roughly go. It was, um, you know, related to the, the, the things you do when you first get a job and you get this great opportunity and you're trying to take care of your sister and you're a little bit behind financially. Like we, we knew those steps that we wanted to follow. And then it's just in every episode, we would just ask ourselves relentlessly, like what, what's his emotional story? What, what's he feeling? What's he worried about? You know, what's mm -hmm. stress? Is his stress, for example, housing? Because if his stress is housing, then what does that really mean? He feels rooted, you know, he feels unrooted. And then how can we, how can we explore that, you know, in a like linear plot way? And then how can we reflect that with his own patient? And then, and then once we've established that for him and we feel like the episode is grounded in his story, then, um, then we can explore the other characters. And I, so the true north is what is the frame? There were some rules. Um, I'm not a big believer in rules because they, they, they box us in, but there were some rules because, you know, we believed the show needed to be grounded and it needed to be emotionally honest. And like that stuff I said at the beginning about ER versus Grey's Anatomy, it wasn't going to be soap. It wasn't going to be heightened melodrama. That's just not what it was. So there were some, <laughs> there were some rules, like nobody was ever going to have sex in the hospital, you know? Um, nobody's going to really gossip on our show. That's the kind of stuff, you know, little things like that. Mm -hmm. But but if we could stay true to his emotional story and what he's feeling, then everything, and it was hard to do that, painful. But if we could, then everything else would fall into place. Uh, so for all of you, I mean, in terms of that, would you look for opportunities to, uh, like wherever Bash was in a particular episode, to uh, mirror it or find a commentary on it in another character's story or in another medical another medical story that walked into the hospital, like a way of seeing the different facets of that particular moment or that particular challenge that Bash was facing? You could, but you don't have to. Like, mm -hmm. if, the other characters didn't need to have reflective journeys. But if Bash's journey is true and honest and emotional in the way that we, we think it is, that's, you know, if we feel that it is, then the episode has its solid grounding and that anything else that happens, you know, if one of the supporting doctors, if one of their characters has a nice little mirror, that's great, but it doesn't need to because the, the episode is, ang is anchored as long as Bash's story is true. And then, you know, you take the same storytelling principle, or we would take the same storytelling principle and apply it to everybody else. You know, and so we was very deliberate giving each of the supporting characters simple places to start from, simple archetypal places to start from that you could kind of in one sentence understand where they were at in their lives. And so try and starting from those places, you could, we tried to do the same thing with all of them. Um, it's harder with Bash than it is with the rest of them. Do you guys want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, we think, I think, to talk about the patients mirroring the lead cast we we did run into a couple times where as joe said we we would get a little matchy matchy where it was like we'd come up with a medical story and then we would really try to like jam it into the emotional theme of of you know the the frame of the character and and it would ring a little false sometimes you know where we would be like okay so we're telling the emotional story through the patient um and so we really had to tread a, a, a thin line of balance between patient stories that propped up the emotional frame of each character, but didn't sort of like seem too convenient because I mean, if you, there's, it's unlikely that the exact patient with the same emotional state is going to come in to, you know, the hospital. So, um, so yeah, I mean, every day Joe would say, what's the frame for the character? And we'd be like, please stop asking us that question. But you know, he was right. And so we would figure it out and then we would figure out how to use the patient's stories to to sort of like 
challenge that theme instead of match that theme. Mm -hmm. um, how are the ways that we can challenge the character through the situations we're putting them in, through the decisions they have to make through the superiors they have to answer to instead of saying, how can the patient match the character? That's good. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, Rachel, I was gonna say, how are doctors and werewolves similar? <laughs> Um, Rachel and I uh, worked together before she went off to do transplant on the order and they're just crazy like they're worlds that we don't know anything about like one is completely made up but it has comes with its own textbook of rules um, the medical I know you have a particular expertise in a particular uh, uh, roadway through the system but uh, how you know, how does not knowing help you? How do you pitch stories about uh, worlds that you don't know much about? Uh, how do you prepare? I think um, when it comes to, you know, the difference between genre and real life, genre is easier because you can create a solution out of thin air as long as it feels authentic to the series because you're working with, you know, rules that don't exist in our world. So that's not so much the case when you're working on a, a medical show, but uh, on the flip side, you actually have people who have done the job that you can go and ask. Um, and we were very lucky in that we had some really incredible consultants and we spoke regularly to them multiple times as we were breaking episodes, we would run our problems by them and we would say, we want to do this. And they'd be like, no, that's not the thing. That's cute. Don't do that. Um, or they would say, yeah, we can totally make that work. And here's a, here's the right way to do that. Um, and you know, uh, some of our writers, uh, Sammy as well, come from families who have doctors in them, which was very useful. Um, for me, I don't have any medical family members, but I have, you know, as you said, come through the medical system and still, you know, navigate the medical system on a regular basis. So uh, I think the thing, the key for me was in, in human nature more than in medical, because there was always a way to make, um, make the medical fit the human problem. Um, and so, you know, I definitely brought some stories that were personal to me or stories that I witnessed friends go through and say, I know this isn't right for this episode, but here's the emotional core of this problem that this person is dealing with or that I've dealt with, or, um, how can we find a medical story that fits that? So, uh, mm. we joke that we've basically become honorary Google doctors after this show because we spent so much time on the internet, all, like all of us just reading medical journals and understanding terminology and talking to doctors. And so, um, there were definitely some late nights saying we need the blood pressure to go up instead of down. How do we do that? You know, and we would just find a case study that fit the problem. Um, I, I just can't downplay the amount of research that goes into doing it, but also it was never about the medical. It was always about the character. So when you find the medical that works, instead of making that front and center, it's about saying, here's the medical that works. How can we explain that in a concrete and easy to digest way that props up what the emotional core of the problem is um, for both the doctor and the patient? So I think we did a lot of preparing in that respect and a lot of talking through not just our leads emotional stories, but our characters, our, our, our day players and our patients emotional stories as well to understand what people were dealing with and why. Um, and Joe encourages people to come in with personal stories if, if they're willing to share, you know, so that helped us because a lot of people said, oh, I've, you know, been through this or I've seen this or I've experienced this. How can we give that over to the show? And that's, I think, the challenge to say, here's my story. Um, I'm going to give it to the show. It's now not my story. It's the show's story. I can't hold tightly to it anymore. I can't be precious about it. It's not going to be for me. It's to service the show. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you're bringing a personal story to especially, you know, a, a big show with lots of moving pieces, I think you need to be prepared to sort of gift it and then allow it. It's like Lego, you build onto it and it's cool because everybody has their idea of what it's supposed to be. And ultimately you craft something that you never expected it to be. It's also super painful because you're like, no, this was going to be a car and now it's a freaking airship and I don't know what to do with that. So, you know, it, it was a learning experience for me in terms of how to stop being precious about my own experience and to, to say what works for the show and how can we still tell the truth about the emotion of it 
Um, so there was a lot of kind of personal preparation in that respect too. If I'm going to do this, how can I give it away and not be afraid of that? I, thank you. Um, I was intrigued Joe, by, you know, when you said that uh, you were really uh, invested in telling a story about a hero, not an anti-hero, like you'd kind of like enough already. Um, can't, I'm not asking about season two, but can a, can a hero stay heroic and maintain an audience's interest? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in Bash's case, I mean, yeah, yes. Big underline, underline, yes. Mm -hmm. Bash's case, um, you know, he's got so much vulnerability. Like, um, he's got the trauma and he's got the past and he's got, and he's, and he's allowed to fail. And that's actually, that's something that I learned as a sort of writer of television, you know, that sometimes you're, sometimes you, you're writing for, on a procedural or whatever, and there's, you're writing about heroes and they're not allowed to be wrong and they're not allowed to make mistakes because there's this idea that that gets in the way of their heroism. But Bash is allowed to make mistakes. He's allowed to be wrong. He's allowed to step back. And so, you know, so yeah, so, you know, so, so because, so there's always room for him and he's always expanding in multiple directions, you know, like he's, he's mining his past and the problems with his past are preventing him from being a good brother slash father and a good doctor slash friend. And so he's just constantly going to have to battle with that. And he's also, you know, he was trained somewhere else, you know, so he, even though he's got great facility with the English language and he's a super good doctor with great instincts, he learned different rules in some cases, different politics, different, different culture, you know, and, and he brings that. So it's, uh, he's up against it there. And then of course he's, got this whole life to build. So he's just challenged on every side. And so he's got so much room to grow and to keep making mistakes. Um, it's because he's allowed to be vulnerable that, that I think there's so much room there for him. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a question for all of you. Um, it'd be great, we'll go if we can, Sammy, then Rachel, then Joe. Um, I know that uh, we, we always have great plans when we begin. Um, but things are always going to change along the way. That's part of the challenge. Um, some of them are fairly standard for any show. What we all know is the old uh, not enough time, not enough money problem. But there's things that are very specific to the, you know, the show you're doing. So if uh, I could ask each of you, if you remember, uh, to talk, of, like, tell me, tell all of us about a, uh, maybe a challenge that arose out of the not enough time, not enough money column and then a challenge that arose out of like the very specific world of transplant yeah um well first i uh i have to give a shout out because i uh i think the production team and the crew in montreal did a fantastic job so from from my vantage point uh like i had a, a, a rachel called it the zombie baby episode um and i was like totally skeptical that they would one, Joe, Rachel, Virginia, Tara, the producers would go for it, uh, but they went for it. They they did it, and you know, uh, a friend who uh, his wife is an OB was saying, "Oh, that baby looked fantastic," um, and uh, so I think like they did an amazing job. And also give a shout out to uh, Virginia Rankin, the producer, and Lauren McKinley who uh, uh, helped us with the medical, help, helped us execute the medical. Um, and she did an incredible job. Um, so like from, from my vantage point, like Joe and Rachel may disagree because they were on set way more than I was, but it was like the challenge was in breaking the show. It was like figuring out what the show was. It's like, how much time is Bash gonna be outside of the hospital? Um, there, were, there was an early episode where he was outside of the hospital for the, for the whole episode um, and we had to scrap it and start over uh, and just like figuring out that balance and also that like matchy matchiness. Oh, this is like too matchy matchy or like, what is the tone of the show? Like, how do you calibrate, how, how do you calibrate this? How do you thread this needle of what the networks need for a, a, a prime time procedural with this like kind of smoldering story 
existential story of a refugee seeking to find his place in a new country. Um, so it, it took just like a lot of work. It took like, you know, and I, I go back to like the thing I was talking about, just the fact that, you know, the three of us and the other writers who were, were on the show, like had, have unconventional backgrounds. So we were uh, approaching the stories, not with formula, but with emotion and, and, and life and that like, you know, you're talking about the emotional North Star. It's like, uh, Joe is like almost like a savant about this. Like, cause on the one hand he can hold, he can hold the break of an episode in his mind by just like walking in a room and looking at the board, like within minutes, within minutes, he's just got it. He's like, oh, then what if we move this here? And he'll just like pull something up. But then also that emotional North Star. Uh, and that's like, you know, to be a little romantic, that's like pretty rare, I think. It's like that that obsession that I was talking about, you know, that I, I, I wonder, you know, comes from being a, a Jewish kid growing up in Winnipeg, but, you know, a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, but also just obsessed to tell a story, to get it right, to be emotionally true. Uh, and that, that meant there was a process of discovery, right, where we were like trying and failing with a couple episodes, but that's what it is. And on American shows, they have tons of time to do that. They have like months and months to do that. But on a Canadian show, it's harder because that, um, and I, that's where I guess it comes back to your question where the, the, the money is like, uh, that's where it's, I think it's felt because in the States, they get so much more time to develop um, and, you know, with a team, with a writing team. And in Canada, that's really rare. Um, but to Joe's credit that he, budgeted that time, he fought for that time um, so that we could, we could do that, we could fail, but there was still time to sort of get our act together and then get cracking. So where the first block of episodes were a challenge, um, then we really hit a sweet spot. I remember like where, you know, uh, like Shelly, I think you stopped by like at one point at the Sphere office and it was like, we were like, uh, we were, we were at that point, we could just like, crack through it. It's like, okay, what's the medical, you know, matrix style. It's like, do, 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 do. That's what we need. We just need the two moves. And then this is what's going on with bash and figure it out. Um, but it took that early trial and error to get there. The agony. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah. Uh, what was the first part of the question? Oh, uh, the, the standard problem, time and money. And then specific right. challenges that arose just out of the very specific show you were making. I mean, I think we made a very big show on a, you know, respectable, but still very Canadian budget. And that's not easy. Um, and we, our producers are incredibly savvy. Um, and, you know, as Sammy said, our production team did an amazing job. We also had an incredible cast. So sometimes if we felt like, oh, are we going to pull this off? The cast just brought it home you know um so but I we're doing an ensemble show where every single doctor needs to have a medical story and those are big you know there's lots of movements and training and you know equipment that needs to be used I think none of us probably fully understood how much equipment and you know um we definitely realized as we went forward like what kind of equipment it took for um CPR to be done you know CPR needs to be done on on a dummy because it it will hurt a human if we make it look authentic so all of a sudden our dummy budget is like massive and we're like oh well okay, who knew that we'd need so many dummies we have a room full of <laughs> anyway um of uh we're all we're all uh, okay. anyway um <laughs> I'm like calling myself a dummy here but um uh so i think you know in terms of the scope of the medical shows we we learned a lot about what it takes to to do an ensemble show with medical um in terms of the specifics of transplant the time just to to get all of those stories right i mean i've never worked that hard in my life and it was incredibly fulfilling um but there was never i think you know there's a disease of relentlessness in in 
in every person we had on our, our staff and crew. We all relentlessly wanted to do a great job. We all relentlessly wanted to tell a great story that resonates. Our whole writer's room was relentless about the work that they wanted to do. But that means that we're never fully satisfied. It can always get better. And, you know, it's, it's a great way to be. It's also exhausting because you want to improve it right up until the last second. So we relentlessly worked on the scripts until they hit the floor and after they hit the floor. And um, it's, it's a big job when you have an, episode, an order of 13 episodes, which doesn't happen frequently. Um, so yeah, I learned a lot about what it really takes to say, you know, it's never going to be perfect, but it's going to be good and it's going to be important and it's going to be, um, it's going to be the work at the end of the day and the value is in doing it, not necessarily in the perfection of it, because that's not a thing that exists. Joe okay. Um, Oh, was there two, two, I guess, two, two stories about hurdles. Um, first one's a bit longer. The, the, this was alluded to, but um, earlier by me and by Sammy, like that, that in, the, in the infancy of the show, uh, you know, the, the beginning of it came, you know, there was the research and all that, but the writing of the pilot was like a thing of beauty. Like talking to a bunch of writers, all of you know that writing is the worst, like it's terrible. But when I wrote that pilot, um, it was, it was great. It was fun. It, it was easy. You know, like I, and when Sammy said, what Sammy said about the finished show being my first draft, he's basically right. Like we fits with it a little bit and there were here and movements forwards and backwards. But at the end of the day, it was pretty much that script. And so that was great. And then I thought, well, this is the show, but it turns out <laughs> that it wasn't. And that the easiness of writing the first episode was matched by the like the impossibility of writing the second episode. And mm -hmm. it became this, okay, you've written a cool premise pilot and it's an action movie and it's, everybody agreed it was, it was good, but um, what's, what's the show? You know, um, this network's ordered a medical drama, needed to most, we were building a big hospital. I mean, we were spending a lot of money to build, build a big hospital. So there was no doubt that the show had to take place in a hospital and had to transition from that pilot into something else. And so I knew like the North Star I talked about, I, I knew that going back to the beginning, but no, kind of knowing that and then putting it into practice in a script are very different things because you just like what Sammy said about tone and finding the tone and finding the balance. And that was a real exercise. And it began while the show was in development in 2017. It continued after the show was ordered, you know, while we were still trying to crack the second episode. Um, I was doing it. I had incredible people helping me, you know, team of writers who were amazing and we we're trying to get it right. And we, you know, whether it's by, but whether it's by our own es esteem that we weren't quite there or the opinions of our uh, various stakeholders, um, that was, you know, we're up against it with that. And, um, you know, every, every crack, every kick of the can was admirable, but it just wasn't quite right. It wasn't quite right. And then at some point, you know, early on, um, Somebody had said, uh, the guy, Jeff Wachtel from NBC Universal, when he read the pilot, he said that it was like the night of meets ER. And that that's kind of what they bought, that there was this, um, there was this, that quality to it. And how do you, and, and I was so, I was flattered, but so vexed by that, because how do you, the first episode has this car crash and it's an action movie. <clears throat> so how do you continue the stakes of that? How can you possibly continue the stakes of that? You can't have an explosion in every episode. Uh, that there's no budget for that and it's also not the show and that was the thing and then it, you know eventually there was a moment of crystallization and realization that was probably over a period of weeks not a second but that we could recreate the tension of the pilot emotionally <laughs> i know i'm a broken record with that kind of stuff but we started the second episode with bash having an argument with his sister about a stethoscope that belonged to their father that he didn't tell her that he had. And it infused that we hadn't done that yet. And it infused the story with like emotional tension. It made you wonder about where he'd come from and where he was going and what their relationship was. And then on his way to work, he sees a, just a very quick glimpse of a boy in a gas mask. And it, it situates you like, Oh, what is this? What is this? Mm -hmm. It's something else. And, and I, and then we, and that a lot, really, truly, that allowed a lot of us to figure it out. And then, um, 
then, then in that same episode, we have a medical story in which a patient has got liver damage and she has blotches on her skin because of the liver damage and bruising and Bash uh, writes suspicious bruising on her chart mm -hmm. and the social worker at the hospital ends up separating the family. Um, and then, so we real so that's a story of family separation. You know, ba Bash has got this emotional problem with family separation and the medical story is family separation. So that for us kind of tied it all together. We realized we could find that tension in his personal life and then we could explore it in the patients. And so that was the hardest part that was, um, you know, like Sammy said, once we kind of got past that, it started to go uh, quicker and easier and, and doing that. We had to do the work to get there. The second one I would say in the sort of a money question is we knew, me and um, Tara and Virginia at Sphere knew from the very beginning that um, if the car crash that starts the show isn't great, isn't like super duper amazing, that we'll just lose everybody in minute six. Mm -hmm. So we just were bought into that. And I have to give them credit for that, for standing behind that and providing the, like the, the structure and the money and the patience to, and Holly Dale, the director who, you know, met, who, who just, to tore apart our schedule to make it work. Like, like it's Canadian television, you shoot 11, 12 pages a day. We shot that sequence, which is like four pages in three days. Like it was like, uh -huh. a, yeah, 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 it was like a movie. And mm -hmm. because there was so much patience there and like dedication and um, belief that if we could pull that off, everybody kind of knew that if we did that, then we'd kind of have them, uh, the audience, I mean, a little bit, um, you know, that and that, and that was, so that was an important lesson in start with a bang. <laughs> okay. I am, uh, I'm going to open up the floor to uh, people who might want to throw some questions uh, your way. Um, we did get a nice, um, you got a, a comment from someone. The production value of the show is very high. It looks great. Uh, I can agree more. It does look fantastic. Um, and here's a question from one of the, attendees it is a multiple it's a two-point question uh what stage were the scripts at when you started production and did you have Bash, bash's emotional season arc completely planned out before you started production or did the actors take on the character change anything um i'll start uh when we started production we had three scripts we had six scripts right yeah, we, we had six. We had six scripts and then two outlines. So scripts for one to six and then outlines for seven and eight and almost an outline for nine. So we were in okay shape. Like, um. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all just laugh for a moment. <laughs> um. Okay. <laughs> this moment of levity brought you by budget. <laughs> um. <laughs> But yes, we had the emotional arc. We did. We, 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 we talked about it in the writer's room. In fact, you know, Samuel said, like, it, it was kind of arced out in development. It was in, it was all, it was in the Bible that we wrote, you know, both before development, during and after the, 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 the generalities of the emotional arc where we wanted to take him. But then we all knew that you had to do the work in every episode. Like, even though you made general plans, you had to write every episode to make sure you were going, we all know this, you were going in the right direction. So, yeah, we had it roughly planned out, but we were open, I think Rachel said this, we were open to proving ourselves wrong in the writing and breaking of episodes. And, and when we did prove ourselves wrong, we would allow ourselves the freedom to veer. And um, Hamza Haq, who was amazing, did, like, I knew he would be good before anything happened, but the, um, the vulnerability that he's able to bring, for me anyway, uh, did help. Yeah. Like, it opened up what we were able to do with the character, how we could write to him. As soon as we saw him on day one, we knew there was a lot of depth, more depth than we thought, and we knew there was lots of depth. That's actually, I mean, I have to say the casting was amazing. You know, from your lead to all the other main characters, even to day players. Uh, do you want to give a shout out to your casting director? Yeah. Um, I give out a shout out to our casting directors in Montreal uh, who are incredible, who it was like such a, such a huge show to cast, you know, mm -hmm. they had their hands full with like the Montreal versus the Toronto dynamic. And then also to Virginia Rankin and um, Lauren McKinley at Sphere who, you know, well, I was 
busy with story were also like going through the thousands of auditions and you know working with the directors there so it was a group effort um, mm -hmm. day players the regulars was just all of that was just kismet i think you know. and i imagine that probably some of those other actors uh you know did the same thing uh that hamza did which is opened up uh opportunities for you guys to tell stories and maybe go even deeper into an emotional take than you had imagined. You want to talk about Laurence, Rachel? It's such a, it's such a cool thing to, you know, envision a character and sort of have them be a faceless entity that you're writing to um, and then see what somebody can bring to that character. So, you know, we had written Meg's um, and we all like love this little spitfire that we wrote in Meg's that had no kind of like concept of how this could be brought to life and encapsulated. And Laurence uh, Lebeuf, who's just an incredible actor, she just just knew that character inside and out. And the second she stepped on the floor, just was able to bring Meg's to life. And nobody can nobody can play Megs like Laurence because she can just she can get through all of the medical you know jargon that you have to learn super fast at lightning speed and her brain works as fast as the characters did and and so for us we suddenly realized like oh this is you know this is Megs this is who she is we had part of her and Laurence brought part of her and then we felt like we could really write to her her skill and she can, you know, give you so much emotion with just a look. And so for us, we were like, oh, now we can, you know, even pull back on on the dialogue of the character because Laurence can deliver something that we, you know, didn't maybe think we could deliver without words. And she was just like, bam, right there. So mm -hmm. it was a great learning experience and seeing, you know, what an amazing actor can bring to a role and then how you as a writer can say, oh, let's build on that and expand it and, and make it bigger and more fulsome than it was. Um, I've got a question from Joe, following what you said at the beginning, was there a specific moment when you knew you had earned the right to tell Bash's story? It was, um, you know, it, it, I would talk to people all along and like Sammy said, like talk to Syrians um, and try to, as I'm going through the process, um, try to get varied opinions, you know, people who disagreed with each other, who both came, who all came from Syria, just get, get the, the way we like to do it in the writer's room, everybody's opinion and, you know, get the complexity of that. And um, I was using the, the, the sort of feel of that as a barometer. And, um, you know, th when I finished the pilot script, of course, I had people read it and um, uh, Syrians and they, they, and I was, you know, like Tara, Tara would say, we, we were very nervous and um, for the feedback, but um, people felt we were being honest, you know, so that was, um, they really did. I mean, we were quite overwhelmed by, by it. Um, you know, we had put a lot of work in to get there, but people felt after the pilot that we were being honest. And so, and so, uh, so we thought, okay, we, we think we can do this and um, we just need to continue to be that fastidious going forward. So, so that process never stopped. You know, it didn't stop it, with, the, with the writing, with the reading of the scripts, with, with the onset consultants, and even in post-production. So, um, so, so I did get to a point early on where I, where I thought I had, and then we just kept holding ourselves to that standard the whole time. And I have to just like chime in too, because another part of it was, you know, the, not just the responsibility and the stuff behind the scenes but like putting things into the script like his faith um which were really important to joe you know they were really important to me they were really important to rachel um and you know those are the things that people talk about like groundbreaking uh parts of the show that you have a muslim character who is just a muslim guy you know he's not a terrorist he's not you know some oil shake he's just a muslim doctor and those are really really important to joe he took that charge that responsibility really, really seriously. Um, and like there, there are particular moments, like I think it's two, it's like, we're gonna see him pray in two. Because if we don't see him pray in two, then we're gonna go, the only place we can do this then is we go to five and then we have like the Eid episode 
Um, and you know, that was like incredible to have an, it actually the Eid's on Friday too. So Eid Mubarak everybody in advance. Um, but, uh, you know, that was like, that was really important to Joe and he took that mission seriously. Um, and you know, unfortunately it's kind of sad that, that, that transplant is groundbreaking because of that, because it's like a Muslim character that you haven't seen. And it's not about, you know, Navy SEALs shooting up, uh, you know, Baghdad. It's not about a SWAT team, you know, rolling through everywhere, shooting everywhere up. It's just about this Muslim character's journey um, and that sort of fidelity to an emotional truth, but also to a kind of documentary truth as like a documentarian myself, like Joe and Rachel have this obsessive quality to like get, get it right, you know, like get the emotional part of it right, but also get like the facts right, get as close as you can to how it actually is. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, the show wouldn't be what it is without that. And, you know, and Sammy, you know, a huge part of that um, throughout the whole process and also Hamza, you know, and Hamza was a huge part of that. Like talk, he, he was so, everything Sammy just said that was so important to Hamza all the way through and Hamza had a voice, you know, he wasn't reading outlines or coming to the writer's room, but um, his voice from before a word was ever written on the show as, um, you know, as a Muslim man, as an immigrant himself was, was informing the character and that was all part of the process. And Sammy, like Sammy would remind us so frequently that nobody is a monolith, you know? There's anecdotal experience to be had for each person and everybody's experience is different. And, and that was such a valuable reminder in the room to say, you know, this is, this is one, this is one person we can't, we can't just assume it's going to encompass everything that's reductive. Um, and his, his voice in that respect was so valuable, you know, for us to remember, this isn't a monolith, this is just, we're telling one story. So let's be true to that story. Um, we have a question about the endometriosis storyline, Ms. Langer. Um, how did you get to the issue? How did you decide to write about it? It was fantastic. I love how the patient was standing up for herself. I don't know where you got it. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I've made no secret of the fact that I have endometriosis, so that was um, a storyline, I think like two days before we started the room, you know, you always do an intro, the showrunner always lets you know, like what's going to happen. And I think Joe had said, look, think about, are there any personal stories that you want to share that you'd be willing to do? And then, you know, a couple weeks into the room had said to me, do you want to talk about this? I know you've, I had actually just gone through major surgery two months before we started the room. So I was still physically healing from that and definitely still emotionally healing from that. Um, and so I, it took me a while to decide whether I wanted to dredge that up again. Um, but a lot of it was drawn from my experience and then a lot of it was different. You can't, that's, you know, you can't make something exact, but um, it was important to me that, you know, the patients who rarely get a voice, who have some kind of chronic problem, who, you know, often get overlooked, especially in an emergency room setting where they're there to deal with really acute issues, um, could be seen in a way that I don't feel like, you know, people who suffer from endometriosis are, are seen very often. So, um, but that story, like, it was a huge team effort. It, it may have started with, you know, some of my journey, but the whole, the whole group just came together and kind of said, okay, how can we make this dramatic? How can we make this real? How can we make this true? And how can we make it important to the doctor who's dealing with it? So it definitely took on a life of its own. Um, but I'm glad that people found it resonant. That's great. And just to like interject and like disagree a little bit with Rachel. I mean, that was, that was Rachel. That was Rachel. That was her story, right? Like she put herself out there um, and she like the emotional truth at the core of it was her. And that was not easy, you know, and like to go through notes, network notes, let alone like people who you like and respect giving you notes on your own personal story. Like that's messed up. It's like, this is, this is what I've been through. But like that's that emotional specificity. That's what I was talking about like earlier, like drawing from that 
emotional specificity. So it isn't soap, you know, it's not like there's a scene in Grey's that was like that. It's like, no, this is what they actually told me. Um, and I think, again, like the show wouldn't have been that without, especially like Joe and Rachel and the actors going to the mat like that um, and just taking those big swings for the fences. I would also say that to Sammy's point, Rachel, the, the script was taken out of her episode in, in the process that can be so, you know, trying of making broadcast television, the story that she poured all of her heart into, which was so beautifully done by her, then had to come out of the episode and be changed to move into another episode. And that's a hard thing for any writer to deal with in any situation. But she just, you know, rewrote it so it could fit somewhere else. So thanks. I'll send you the bill to my therapist. <laughs> oh, well, um, actually, that's not a bad segue um, about taking care of yourself. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a demanding job. Uh, doubly demanding, I think, when you have to go live in a another city. Um, I don't know how French was the crew. French. Okay, so that too. Um, uh, I think that so many pressures come to bear, and you're trying to hold on to a tiny bit of your real life so that you remember why you're doing it in the first place. Um, and. I think it's a shock for a lot of people as they, as they enter this world, and particularly as they start to move up the ladder, how much it wants from you. And um, so if this is sort of like the advice portion, if you will, like what, uh, what how do you take care of yourself? Um, what advice do you have for people about when you're starting that gig? Like I always say, like you have to carve out some time for X and Y. I'm not gonna get into my specifics, but tell me um, how you keep it together and, and what you'd like other people, uh, like how you'd like to inform young writers about uh, how to stay healthy. You gave that advice to me right before we started. Carve out some personal time, you said. I don't think I took the advice. I don't think you did. Not yeah. so much. Yeah. I think that's great advice. I think, you know, um, you know you probably a lot of us, um, when facing the mountain of work, all we do is we, we work. And when you're away, like we were for this, you're away from your family or your loved ones or your partners or whatever, then there's, you just get up and work and work until you go to bed. And so that's, you know, good on the one hand because needs to happen but your advice that i may not have taken um was the right advice you know you need to i know we, we i think we got better at it as we were going through the season like speaking personally but you do have to do that you do have to make an appointment to go to the gym and keep the appointment you know you have to separate your especially when you're away for a job you have to separate your personal life from your work life you can't and even if even if those hours are a bit weird, you have to adhere to it. So that was good advice, Shelley. I'm so glad you weren't able to take it to me. I I think um you have to set physical parameters for yourself and emotional parameters for yourself. Um and I you know, like Joe, I'm not sure I did the best job of that. Uh and so like doing the things that you know keep you healthy and keep you know your like physicality kind of in shape helps you emotionally and mentally as you're working um and i think also you have to get a little cozy with the word no sometimes uh, which is difficult i mean i was i was flying across the country i think i did 26 round trips last year across the country um and i would be home for 40 hours and then i would go back um and I think that goes back to what Sammy was talking about in terms of working with people who have your back. And I, I remember there was one time where I think Joe said, you need to book a trip home. You need to do it ASAP and you need to take a couple extra days because you've only had like two nights at home consistently for the last couple months. And you need to not answer my texts when you're there. Um, and, you know, that's true. Um, and so I'm very bad at saying no when I know somebody's working really hard and I'm not there to help and I, you know, need to 
I have this kind of relentless desire to make sure that I'm giving as much as I, as I can and as much as other people are giving. But there were definitely times by the end of the season where I'm like, I'm turning my phone off for 40 hours and that's just going to be the way it is. It has to be. Um, that was a hard lesson for me to learn. But, I, but after the 40 hours, I could come back and give double because I was restored uh, in a way that I wouldn't have been if I hadn't done that. Um, so that taught me a lot. And now, you know, coming out of that, like when I got home, I was like, oh, I can actually say no when I need to, when I know it's right. And when I, you know, and I'll still freak out about it and text three people and be like, is it okay if I say no to this thing? But, you know, it's crucial to learn that skill because the only way that you can find any semblance of balance in an industry that will continue to take everything you have if you're not kind of the person who can set your own parameters. Sammy, son of a doctor. Well, I, I have to admit, I was not in Montreal for as long. I was only in Montreal for three months and right. I, I have uh, kids and I didn't suffer <laughs> what Joe and Rachel would say, but I like maybe attack the question in a different way. I think like uh, Joe and Rachel, they almost want to be told when they're wrong, you know? So like in terms of like mental health in the room, it's like, that's really rare. Like just in, in life in general, where you can just be honest with someone. Um, and especially for a show like this, which is about, you know, Joe is not a Syrian refugee, he's not a Muslim man, that Joe would welcome that, would welcome those discussions. So we're talking about, it's like, you gotta see and pray. And two, it would be like, Joe would be like, yeah, he'd think about it and, and get that. And I think that's kind of why, we, you know, we've kind of reached this crisis point in, in uh, you know, conversations about diversity and inclusion because there are too many people who aren't like that. You know, for too long, there's been uh, showrunners and creators who are just very uh, arrogant in their narrow belief and not just showrunners and creators, but executives too. Uh, and so I think Transplant exists because the, the space and the, 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 um, the boundaries that Joe and, and Tara and Virginia um, are, are pushing. Um, and so I hope like the Canadian film industry, TV film industry, uh, there is like a little bit of a reckoning um, because one thing that's kind of weird for me because I work a lot in the US, work mostly in the US and then work in Canada too, but there is like a reckoning with accountability in the US now. Not like it's, it's you know, everything is kumbaya and all great, but you have CBS, the most conservative of all of the, the networks committing 25% of their budget of their new shows to shows about African Americans. And I, and I, I just, I see in Canada, there's a lot of like talk, we're going to have talks about this. We're going to have like a website and study about this, but like, where's the substantive change, you know? And that's where like, actually that can improve people's mental health. You know, that can like, if you're, if you're supporting, uh, creators of color in the room, if you're open to those discussions the way Joe is, if you're like funding shows. Um, so I hope, you know, the institutions are made up of people and, you know, uh, the private broadcasters are, are good people. They mean to do good work, but I just hope that collectively we can sort of get to a point where there's actual action being taken, not just studies, because, you know, people have been dying, you know, Muslims have been killed and demonized. African Americans, Black Canadians have been killed, Indigenous peoples. So that I wish there were sort of more creators like Joe and Rachel who had space for for truth and honesty. I so want to end it right there, um, but I'm, as is my want, going to end it on something profoundly trivial. Um, so we'll let that resonate, you guys. Sammy is the person that you're gonna follow, not me. But I couldn't help wondering, you're doing all that medical research. What disease did you think you had? Uh, I mean, <laughs> all of them. I, I... <laughs> Didn't you like buy flashcards for us, Joe, yeah, that had like, <laughs> Yeah. If you have a headache, you probably have X. Yeah, yeah that's very helpful. Airport somewhere, and it's like whatever. Yeah, if your fingernail hurts, you have probably nine cancers. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. On some, I on some level, um, toiling in all of that, um, I stopped uh, being. Uh, I stopped worrying about it. You know. Um, I guess because we were solving everybody's problems. <laughs> the doctors <laughs> saving everybody. So no matter what we have, it's going to be okay. <laughs> really? Because. I'm now obsessed with my spider beans. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel. Um, I, I, there was one day where I think I texted Joe from the parking lot and said, I can't actually see out of my right eye anymore. Um, and like five ophthalmology appointments later, um, they're figuring out that it's like migraines and I'm like, oh, cool. Okay. That's like something I can deal with. But I definitely ran the gamut of, you know, all of the other possibilities <laughs> that that could be. Um, I, Sammy, I somehow think not so much for you. Uh, you you've grown up in a medical family. Yeah, I had the, my episode had necrotizing fasciitis. And I, you know, I have to admit that, I mean, I, I, I do have a habit of washing my hands frequently, you know, but after that, I did it even more frequently. And I guess the timing was really good because there was a pandemic that hit a few months later. Um, so yeah, I, 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 that freaks me out. That's like that really necrotizing fasciitis freaks me out still. Don't want to get it. Don't want to get it. Bad, bad idea. <laughs> um, I think that uh, we've reached a natural end on necrotizing fasciitis. Um, <laughs> uh, unless there's anything uh, you guys would like to add. I just wanted to say thanks, Shelly. Thank you so much. Yeah, oh, well, thank, Shelley. thank you for letting me be a small part of it tonight. And thank you uh, to everybody who tuned in. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, I hope you guys can see all the little comments that have come in that are kudos and compliments and uh we thank the writers guild for sponsoring this event and i'm going to apologize to them for not running the teaser at the beginning i was just a little bit nervous so uh but i think you can find it on youtube yeah thanks everybody uh have a great night thank you guys for a fantastic show we look forward to season two and uh that's a wrap bye everybody thank you